Well, good evening to you uh, joining this seminar in Australia and to friends and colleagues in Germany, good morning. I'm Peter Jennings, I'm the Executive Director of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, known to all as ASPE, and I'm delighted to be co-hosting this event with Dr. Beatrice Gauravanshi, the head of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, office here in Canberra. Our theme is the Indo-Pacific, geostrategic challenges and opportunities for Australia and Germany. And it's our honour to be virtually hosting Germany's Minister for Defence, Annegret Kramp-Karrenbauer, who is making Canberra her virtual first stop on her tour of the Indo-Pacific, and Senator Linda Reynolds, Minister for Defence, and a good friend of Canberra, a good friend of Aspie, who was here in lockdown in Canberra from her most recent trip to Southeast Asia. Uh, we have a, a small live audience here, uh, including some ambassadors and high commissioners, but I would particularly like to acknowledge Thomas Fitchin, Germany's ambassador to Australia. So why this meeting and why now? Well, it's particularly noteworthy that the German federal government has recently released this document, Policy Guidelines for the Indo-Pacific, subtitled Germany, Europe, Asia, shaping the 21st century together. And of course, in July this year, the Australian government released its Strategic Update 2020. Now, there is nothing think tankers love more than meaty policy documents to get their teeth into. And I'll have more to say about these in a minute because they intersect in very interesting ways. First, though, we must introduce our distinguished speakers. And to do that, I'm going to hand over the, the floor to Beatrice. Beatrice, over to you. Senator the Honourable Linda Reynolds, Minister for Defence of Australia. Honourable Annegret kramp karrenbauer Minister of Defence Germany, Your Excellency, Dr. Thomas Fitchen, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany, and also warm welcome to the EU Ambassador and to the High Commissioner of Singapore, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. On behalf of the regional programme Australia and the Pacific of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, I would also like to cordially welcome you to this dialogue with the Defence Ministers of Australia and Germany. We are very grateful that the Australian Strategic Policy Institute under the leadership of Peter Jennings is hosting us for this very special event. Tonight, I have the great privilege to introduce our keynote speakers, and it is an honour for me to first welcome Minister Annegret kramp karrenbauer who joins us virtually and live from Berlin, just bridging a distance of approximately 16,000 kilometres between our two capitals. We understand, Madam Minister, that you are currently in home quarantine and therefore we are very happy to see you healthy. Annegret kramp karrenbauer has served as Germany's Defence Minister since July 2019 and as the leader of Germany's traditional mainstream conservative party, the Christian Democratic Union, the CDU, since December 2018. She previously served as Prime Minister, comparable to the role of a Premier here in Australia of the state of Saarland for seven years from 2011 to 2018, the first woman, by the way, to lead this state of Saarland. At the same time, Annegret Kahnbauer was Minister of Justice and Minister of Science and Research from 2012 and 2018 in her state's government. And prior to this, she headed various ministries in her state, among them interior, education and labour. Please also allow me to mention that the minister is a close friend of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Her address and dialogue with Minister Linda Reynolds today marks, as Peter Jennings said, so to speak, the virtual kick-off of her visit to the Asia-Pacific region, and I understand the next point of touchdown will be Singapore. It is my equally great privilege to welcome the Australian Minister of Defence, Senator the Honourable Linda Reynolds, who joins us today from Canberra virtually and also from quarantine since she has just returned from a trip to Asia. 
The Honorable Linda Reynolds was sworn in as the Minister for Defence in May 2019. She has been a Senator for Western Australia since 2014, representing the Liberal Party. She previously served as Assistant Minister for Home Affairs, Minister for Defence Industry and Minister for Emergency Management and North Queensland Recovery. Prior to entering Parliament, the Honourable Senator Linda Reynolds was a member of the Australian Army Reserves for nearly 30 years and was the first woman in the reserve to attain the rank of Brigadier and was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross. Before her ministerial appointment, Linda Reynolds was a member and chair of several parliamentary committees. As a close friend of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, she recently presented the 2020 Defence Strategic Update here at the ASPI. And I might add with a certain pride that Linda Reynolds is also a good friend of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of applause to welcome both ministers at the digital stage. Beatrice, thank you. Um, it's my task now to introduce the topic. Now, you recall that I mentioned the German federal government has recently released a statement entitled Policy Guidelines for the Indo-Pacific, which sets out an ambitious plan for increased German engagement in the region across a wide variety of areas, from the economy to security, the climate, the stability of the rules-based international order, digital connectivity, and people-to-people -people links. The document says, and I'm quoting, these policy guidelines are intended to identify points of departure and opportunities for cooperation with partners in the region. It's clear that Germany, and indeed the European Union, is intent on stepping up its game as we would say in Australia, in the Indo-Pacific. The German Foreign Minister, Heiko Maas, says in his introduction, Germany must not content itself with remaining on the sidelines as a mere observer of these dynamic developments in the Indo-Pacific. And as Minister Kramp Karrenbauer said in a recent article for the Carnegie Endowment, Europe needs to develop an ambition to have a say in global affairs, it needs to strengthen its ability to act, also militarily. So reading the policy guidelines through Australian eyes, what strikes me is the very substantially shared views Germany and Australia have about strategic developments in the region. The policy guidelines say of the Indo-Pacific, the overall structure of the region is in flux in the face of significant shifts in the balance of power, as well as growing differences. Now that is completely in accord, I would argue, with our own strategic update, which says the rules, norms and institutions that help maintain peace and security and guide, and guide global cooperation are under strain. So there are so many points of commonality, so many shared views about risks, and shared views about necessary responses. And while there are clearly many common concerns, the good news is that there are also many opportunities for cooperation. From an Australian perspective, I think that increased German and EU engagement in the Indo-Pacific is an unalloyed good. Now, we are uh, in the process now of posting an article on the ASPE strategist in which Minister Kramp Karamba says, we intend to expand security and defence cooperation with those who share our values in the region, intensify our military contacts and promote dialogue on matters of security. Minister, I hope that you will make Australia the first port of call for this increased cooperation. Now we will hear from our ministers making some initial opening comments and then we will move to discussion and questions. Ministers, can I ask you to uh, unmute your computer so we can hear you? And now I call on Minister Kramp Karanbar to make your opening remarks. Thank you.
Ja, vielen Dank, liebe äh, Linda. Äh, Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dr. Fitchen. Excellencies, Beatrice Goravanci and Peter Jennings, thank you very much. I am delighted to be with you today, this morning or this evening, as the case may be. I am delighted to have this opportunity to meet virtually. I would have preferred to come to Australia in person to be there and talk directly about the options we have to cooperate about our friendship. But unfortunately, it's not possible at the moment. I hope to be able to do that soon. Between Germany and the Indo-Pacific, uh, as you just said, there are more than tens of thousands of kilometers. So why are we interested in this region? Why is it the Indo-Pacific region that the German government has decided uh, to publish guidelines for the first time, by the way? Let me say right away, we're talking about shared interests, shared values, our joint commitment, and that is never a pact or a kind of action that goes against somebody. I see it as cooperation in the interest of what unites us, in the interest of our values, but also in the interest of what we share, the interests we share. As you know, Germany is a strong economy. We act globally in, ter in economic terms and we are a strong proponent of a rules-based international order. A rules-based international order for us is absolutely necessary. We need that because that is also the basis of economic success and that economic success is what we are working on. This is why we have committed ourselves towards maintaining and improving the rules-based international order. We are interested in that and we are also interested in security, stability and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. With China and uh, Japan and the United States, these are the three largest world economies and they are all Pacific neighbors. Southeast Asia is turning into a motor for global economic development. It is the most densely populated region in the world. Two of three mega cities in the world are there. Important trade routes are located there, the South China Sea, the Southern Pacific, and our economies are linked by global supply chains. We can see that with Europe, with the European Union, there is an internal market of more than 500 million people. And that is a strong economic region for us. And so it is important for us to have strong relations with that important region. At the same time, and we have to be clear about that, we can see that the Indo-Pacific becomes the arena of a global power competition. We can see the increasing rivalry between the United States and China, and we as Germans, we as a Germany, have a strong economic relations with China, but also a value-based strong partnership with the United States. This is quite a challenge and that is a similar ch challenge for you as Australia, I'm sure. We are confronted with many unsolved territorial conflicts and armaments developments that are dynamic. And we have to be clear that in Europe, we saw that uh, Russia occupied the Crimea, we saw the conflict in eastern Ukraine, and for us that was the first time since the Second World War that we saw that territorial borders have been changed by violence and unilaterally. From our point of view, that is clearly an infringement of international law, so we continue to support sanctions against Russia. 
This example shows that we condemn such developments not only in Europe, but that is a fundamental principle and that applies everywhere in the world. Similar conflicts in the Indo-Pacific should be seen from the same perspective and with the same idea of values and principles. So the political and economic center of the world seems to be shifting further from the transatlantic to the Indo-Pacific area. So this is where the shaping of the future international order will be decided. Peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region are important for us in Europe and in Germany. Germany wants to be a reliable and stable partner and friend of the region. This is all laid down in this new document in the Indo-Pacific guidelines. We want to live up to our responsibility for a rules-based international order and we want to take active part in shaping that order. So we are prepared to defend our interests with active deeds, not just words, and we have to do that more so than in the past. We have to think of our interests, and that interest means that existing rules and the order, the rule of law needs to be respected, human rights and democratic standards need to be protected, open societies must be maintained, trade routes, sea routes must remain open, and trade must be based on fair rules, intellectual property must be protected. I know that many states in the region, such as Australia, share these ideas. These are our like-minded partners. And in these days where we see the systemic challenges everywhere, because there are countries that are not prepared to accept these principles, I firmly believe that these like-minded countries need to cooperate more, they need to move closer together. So we need strong partnerships, partnerships with countries such as Australia, between Germany and Australia, but we also need an international network that goes beyond that and that must be based on these partnerships. Our Indo-Pacific guidelines, which we decided and published in September, we have set the course for this development. We want to improve our cooperation with the partners in the region. We want to intensify it. And this is not just about security and defense. Our cooperation with Australia is all-encompassing. But today I would like to focus on this field of defense and security. Our cooperation in terms of security and defense with our partners in the region, and that means, first of all, Australia, will be intensified. We want to intensify military contacts and promote our security dialogue. Now, what does that mean? Let me give you a few examples. Maritime presence on the sea routes, that is an important signal to send. As I said in the beginning, in Germany, we benefit, our economy benefits because of its global nature, benefits from free trade routes, free tr sea routes. We depend on that. In this day and age, when the uh, freedom of navigation is under threat, we must send out a strong signal together. Unfortunately, because of the COVID situation and because of pressing operational needs in the Mediterranean, for example, we had to defer our Indian Ocean deployment. But we are sure we can repeat that, we can um, fulfill that next year. We're talking about sending liaison officers to multinational, multinational organizations or the deployment of German Navy officer in Navy units of our friends. We're talking about this with our Australian partners at the moment. We are intensifying our talks about new ways of cooperation, such as cooperation in the field of cyber and information, space cooperation, our chief of defense bef visited Australia in February before the COVID situation became uh, 
problematic, and uh, he discussed further fields of cooperation. We are also closely cooperating as far as armament cooperation is concerned, we're intensifying those activities. And here I'm delighted and proud to say that there is a discussion of using units of German production in the modernization of the Australian Armed Forces. In September, I discussed many of these questions that go beyond bilateral cooperation with representatives of ASEAN countries here in Berlin. ASEAN for us plays a central part in the intensification and promotion of multilateral activities and in the promotion of peaceful ways of settling conflicts. For me, it's clear, with our partners in the region, we want to show more presence, we want to send out a signal of solidarity with our partners that share the same values, and we want to promote the regional security architecture. A strong regional security architecture has a direct bearing on the international security architecture. For me, this means that EU and NATO must play a more active role here. We want to intensify the strategic dialogue with our partners that share the same values. We want to extend our partnership and support each other. The EU has made this clear in their document Enhancing Security with and in Asia. Ursula von der Leyen has made this clear. As you know, NATO has initiated a reflection process, and the reflection group will soon publish its results. One of the points they are talking about is the question as to how our future cooperation with like-minded countries in the Indo-Pacific can be organized and what it may look like. I'm convinced that if like-minded nations, such as our, our nations, work together and join forces, and we must do that to defend our values and our interests in the world, we can achieve a lot in the world. I just talked about German-Australian relations. To us, Australia is an anchor of stability in the Indo-Pacific region. It is a central partner and friend in the region. We have shared ideas of the risks we're facing and the interests, and we share the same values. We're united by our interests in a rules-based international order, where it is not the principle of might is right. We have a long-standing cooperation based on trust, and we can build on that, and we intend to intensify and improve that even more. The intensification of the German-French cooperation will also is also clearly emphasized in our Indo-Pacific guidelines. And as part of the Partners Across the Globe program in NATO, I am supporting this intensification. I've mentioned the reflection process. So we're looking forward to an interesting discussion. In doing so, we're sending out a strong signal in favor of uh, the rule of law, free navigation, prosperity and peace in the Indo-Pacific region. So this is what partnership means to me. Thank you very much for your attention. I am looking forward to our discussion. I'm looking forward to the ideas that Linda is going to describe, what her ideas are for our future cooperation and the link between our regions, the link between Australia and Europe. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you very much indeed. And I recall uh, one of my um, early visits to the German uh, Ministry of National Defence, uh, perhaps um, Six or seven years ago now, I, I raised the possibility of a German naval ship uh, visiting Australia and uh, visiting, transiting through the South China Sea, um, which seemed to be quite a revolutionary concept at the time. It's, it's uh, very, very pleasing indeed uh, to see that this 
uh, is now a, a part of the practical measures that you're considering uh, as part of the policy statement. Uh, Minister Reynolds, can I now hand the floor to you for your uh, opening statement, please? Over to you. Well, thank you, Peter, and uh, good morning to those in Germany and good evening to those in Australia. It's a pleasure to join my German counterpart, Minister uh, Kramp Karrenbauer, and Anna Grit, thank you so much for your very warm remarks and also your very insightful reflections on the Indo-Pacific. But firstly, my sincerest thanks to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and also to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for organising this very important and timely event. And to you, Beatrice and Peter, uh, on a personal note, I very much enjoy and greatly value my long-standing partnerships uh, with both of your organisations. And thanks to you both for your work to strengthen relations between Australia and also Germany. I'm delighted to join all of you here today to discuss how I see the challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, Anna Gret and I first met in person when I attended the Munich Security Conference in February this year, which seems like a very long time ago now. But that was the first and it was a very substantive uh, and very warm and productive bilateral meeting. And since then, we've been in regular contact. So I'm delighted to join you today to discuss uh, our region. When we uh, attended the uh, conference itself, at the conference we discussed the rapidly changing uh, events in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, back then, uh, there was clearly changes to rules-based international global order, as um, has been said and the many strategic challenges, we, dis we discussed the many strategic challenges that faced our respective nations. However, as we all know, just a few weeks after Munich, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic. And now the stark reality is that we all face a post-COVID-19 world that is poorer, that is more dangerous, and that is more disorderly. And I firmly believe that in today's world, Geographical distance is simply, in simply an historic mindset. And it doesn't matter that we're not in the same time zone. It doesn't matter that we don't share physical borders. And as Anna Grit said, it doesn't matter that we live thousands of kilometres away. But to my mind, what does matter are these. Our shared democratic values and our shared trust. Our shared commitment to the rule of law and most particularly, our shared respect for the sovereignty of all nations, be they large or small. And together, we must continue to promote peace and prosperity for all. Towards a, a region where there is cooperation and healthy competition, not confrontation, coercion or conflict. And we achieve this under a rules-based global international order. A rules-based order that protects sovereignty, that preserves peace, fosters trade, and also curbs the excessive use of power. And there's one truism uh, that remains constant for all of us, and that is that security brings peace and peace brings prosperity. One simply cannot exist without the other. And today, the world's most populous region, the Indo-Pacific, is facing its most consequential strategic realignment since the end of World War II. The region, <coughs> excuse me, the region has become less stable and this has significant consequences far beyond our region. So let me share with you how I'm approaching these challenges as Australia's Minister for Defence. In this year, the Prime Minister and I, in July this year, the Prime Minister and I announced uh, Australia's 2020 Defence Strategic Update. And this update is a very significant document for us because it recognises that challenges in our strategic environment are accelerating far more rapidly than we anticipated only a few years ago. And our interests are being challenged more directly and this clearly demands greater prioritisation. So let me set out for you some of our regional challenges as we see them. Without question, we're seeing increased major power competition Nations right across the Indo-Pacific are modernising their militaries and adopting uh, disruptive technologies. In the 2030s, half of the world's submarines 
and half of the world's most advanced combat aircraft will be operating in the Indo-Pacific. And coercive tactics, including cyber attacks, foreign interference, and also economic pressure are being increasingly employed. And these coercive tactics exploit what is now commonly called the grey zone. And this grey zone sits between peace and war, as we traditionally understand them to be, and it undermines sovereignty. And in this grey zone, influence becomes interference, economic cooperation becomes coercion, and investment becomes entrapment. And COVID-19 has further impacted on the global economy and also our strategic landscape. These trends are compromising free and open trade for us all. And it's exposed the need for Australia, along with other nations, including Germany, to build stronger, more resilient and more assured supply chains. And as Defence Ministers, Annegret and I have the job of seeing the world as it actually is, not as we might wish it still was. And in that light, the Defence Strategic Update sets three new defence objectives that really underpin Australia's resolve. They're to shape, to deter, and also to respond. Firstly, to shape our strategic environment. Secondly, to deter actions against Australia's interests. And thirdly, to respond with credi credible military force uh, if and when required. And Australia continues to work uh, with long-standing allies and our friends, but also with new partners to shape an Indo-Pacific where the rules-based international order is respected and it is observed. This is something I speak often about with my counterparts as we continue to work together to address these shared challenges. And to realise this vision, Australia is enhancing our defence cooperation, our defence partnerships, and also our regional defence activities. For example, uh, at India's invitation, Australia is currently participating in Exercise Malabar alongside the United States, Japan and, of course, India. Australia is also seeking to advance our shared interests with ASEAN and we continue to resolutely support ASEAN's centrality. Uh, earlier this year in Hanoi, I presented Australia's vision for the future of our defence partnership with ASEAN. Two weeks ago, I visited three ASEAN partners, Singapore, Brunei and the Philippines, to further advance our bilateral defence engagements and also to further discuss shared regional security challenges. Uh, I also visited Japan to meet with the new Defence Minister Kishi. There, we set the direction for the next phase of our bilateral defence and also our security cooperation uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And despite COVID-19, Australia also continues to conduct significant regional maritime deployments, at seven this year alone with Japan. We also conducted a significant, in fact, it was our largest ever regional deployment, uh, presence deployment. This involved five Royal Australian Naval vessels conducting military training and also exercises with 11 regional partners over three months. And we've continued during COVID-19 to deepen our partnerships across the South Pacific under our Pacific Step Up program. And this includes expanded ADF training activities, infrastructure development, maritime capability, people to people links, and of course, enhanced COVID-19 support. So with this in mind, I very much welcome the German government's publication this year of its policy guidelines for the Indo-Pacific region. And I, as I've said, I very warmly welcome uh, the minister's remarks today about how Germany, consistent with these new guidelines, is intensifying its engagement in the Indo-Pacific. That is very uh, warmly welcomed uh, here in Australia. Through our respective strategies, Australia and Germany have a clear and a very consistent vision for the Indo-Pacific. But it's also one that we share with many other allies, partners and global friends. Uh, and in the years ahead, I look forward to further strengthening our bilateral defence relationship um, as the Minister has said, it's a relationship which has very strong foundations in both defence cooperation and also in defence industry. Uh, for example, uh, Lurson Australia is building 12, is Australia's 12 new offshore patrol vessels uh, on time and on budget, and they're going to be magnificent capability for Australia. 
And Rheinmetall Defence Australia is supplying 211 Boxer Combat Reconnaissance Vehicles for the Australian Defence Force. And again, they are going to be magnificent uh, capabilities for uh, the Australian Army. These and other engagements demonstrate our mutual commitment to strengthening the integration of our respective national industrial bases. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, there is so much potential for us to further enhance our interoperability and to train and exercise together, for us to collaborate, but also to cooperate. Because our cooperation enhances regional stability and security. And as I said, security brings peace and peace brings prosperity for us all. So thank you very much, Peter and Beatrice. Well, ministers, thank you very much both for those very interesting and substantive uh, presentations. Um, as you say, there is there is so much to talk through, so um, I want to get straight to questions. Uh, for those of you watching this webinar online, I am, I'm actually in receipt of some questions here that are coming through that I will be able to put to our ministers. Uh, but I wanted to begin by asking some questions myself. And the first one I'll put to Minister Crump Karanbar. Uh, Minister, your policy guidelines say, uh, I think very acutely, there is a direct nexus between prosperity in Europe and security in Asia. And uh, clearly in, in that understanding, one of the biggest security challenges Asia currently faces comes from the assertive behaviour of Beijing. How does Berlin shape its response to that challenge? Minister. Um, it is very uh, clear. Um, I said this, or I hinted at that earlier during my presentation. Beijing has a significant importance for us. Undeniably, it is a very important trading partner for us and others in Europe. And we know that the big questions of humanity, like climate change, will not be tackled without big nations like China. At the same time, China is also a systemic challenge for us. What we consider the basic rules of an open society, of uh, Western democracy, the protection of minorities, for example, the respect of, for human rights, those values are seen differently in China and interpreted in a different way there. And that's why we need to speak openly about this. China, I believe, has a very ambitious goal, has developed an ambitious concept. There's no problem with that. It's the right of every country to do that. But I agree with Linda that those ambitious uh, those ambitions must not be at the expense of others. And that's why it's so important to have a rules-based order so that conflicts about territory, for example, or when it comes to the freedom of navigation, that those things are resolved where we have the instruments for it. For example, the, um, the sea, the courts dealing with maritime law, etc. and with this conflict, we need to think about how we can manage to continue to have good relations with China, but at the same time have an open dialogue about what divides us. And also very soberly address the difficulties, for example, that there's no um, reciprocal access to markets or the question about protection of intellectual property, security issues, currently, for example, in connection with 5G, those are debated here but elsewhere as well. So have a very rational view 
on our relations. I think that's the first step. And a good cooperation also needs to be able to cope with the fact that you talk about co controversial issues. So this systemic challenge also relates to how the international order will look like in the future. And I think that countries who share values should work more together across the globe than they have done in the past. Minister, thank you. Let me put a question to Linda Reynolds. Uh, Minister Reynolds, what's your reaction to the German policy guidelines? What are your priorities for... Ah, so Linda has... It uh, looks like we've lost the connection with Minister Reynolds. So what I'll do, Minister Crump karenbauer is put a question to you. And, ah, okay. I'm back. Linda's back. Hello, Linda. <laughs> good, good, good to see you there, Linda. I was just beginning to put a question to you um, about your reaction to the German policy guidelines. What are your priorities for defence and security engagement with Europe more broadly? And at the end of the day, is this all about really just seeking to balance China? Well, first of all, as I said in my comments, and thanks, Peter, for the question, is I and the Australian government very much uh, warmly welcome uh, Germany's uh, policy and increased engagement in our region. As I've said, it's, it's no longer about distance and about sort of historical uh, boundaries and relationships after post-World War II. Uh, we've both said that it's about values, it's about democratic principles, it's about adherence to rules-based order. So again, we, I said we couldn't welcome it anymore. And I'm very excited by the prospects and some of the discussions we're now having in things that we can do. In relation to the second part of your question, Australia wants to work with all countries, uh, including China, to combat the range of challenges that the Indo-Pacific faces, including how we find our way out of COVID-related health and economic crises. And you know, Australia hasn't changed. Uh, we remain committed to working with China as with all of our regional partners to advance peace and prosperity. So our, our vision for our region is all inclusive, but we do expect uh, ourselves to live up to international law and adherence to sovereignty, the respect for sovereignty for everybody. But equally, we expect everybody else to respect the rules and abide by the rules and also to respect others' sovereignty. So, we have called out uh, where we've seen actions that have unsettled the stability of our region and we have joined others in expressing our concerns uh, where we see those behaviours and those actions going contrary uh, to all of the things that Germany and Australia and our partners value so, so much. Thanks, Linda. And um, I'm looking forward to the day that our own government releases a document called Policy Guidelines for Engagement with Europe. I, I think that would be <laughs> a fine thing. Uh, Minister Kramp Karimbauer, I wanted to bring you in on Russia. Uh, clearly, Russia looms much more large uh, for Europe than it does uh, in this uh, part of the world. What are your key concerns about Russia? And um, is this strategy for deeper Indo-Pacific engagement in, in any way designed to reduce, for example, German energy dependence on Russia. Uh, for example, I note the strategy refers to a joint Australian-German project on hydrogen. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, indeed, Russia is for Europe and especially for the countries in Northern, Eastern and Central Europe is a more direct threat, a more direct challenge. Russia is striving to defend its own interest and the means they use are various. There have been military activities, conventional armament activities. They have uh, done a lot there. They've increased their armaments level. They 
have been nuclear activities as well. We have seen that with regard to hybrid threats, Russia is presenting a challenge as well. And the catchwords here are, is a disinformation campaign. Just a couple of weeks ago, we saw the attack against Alexei Navalny. He was treated in Germany and he has been, he was poisoned in Russia, that is clear. So for us in Europe and for us in NATO, Russia does present a direct challenge. Talking about energy, energy supply, the first thing to mention is the fact that Germany has never been exclusively dependent on Russian energy supply. That has never been the case and it's not the case now. We are in the process of diversifying our energy supply and that has a lot to do with climate change. So our cooperation on hydrogen, the cooperation we strive for with various partners, this is about using sources of energy that are fit for the future, that help us combat climate change. We, as a highly industrialized nation, must be in a position to preserve our level of industrialization, our level of mobility, mobility made in Germany. That is an important factor for our economy. But we want to do that in a way that is compatible with protecting the climate. So this is our guideline in our energy policy in Europe and in our partnership with Australia and other Indo-Pacific nations. Thanks, Minister. Let me turn the focus to the United States. United States. So, you know, it's increasingly clear that uh, the, the chances are now for a Biden presidency. Can I get uh, the both of you to uh, reflect on that? Is this uh, going to create an opportunity for enhanced defence cooperation between Germany and the United States, Germany, uh, uh, Australia and the United States? Uh, what are your reactions to the presidential election thus far? Uh, Minister Kram Karambel, we might start with you. Um, well, first of all, this is a very exciting race in the United States, full of suspense, and I think we have to wait for quite some time until we have a result, a result that will be accepted by all sides. The policies we've seen in recent years, and I can be frank about that, has sometimes put a strain on our friendship. It has been quite a challenge sometimes. As I said, we are strongly committed to multilateral cooperation and the rules-based international order. We are strongly committed to working together in international organizations. And there have been many debates and discussion with the current administration in the White House. But let me also be quite clear, there are various core issues between the United States and ourselves. They have to do with military cooperation. They have to do with how much Germany is prepared to contribute when it comes to burden sharing within NATO. And there, the Republicans and the Democrats have the same position. So these points will remain on the agenda, irrespective of who will win the race for the White House. If there's a change in the White House, there may be a change as regards the way of dealing with one another, the tone of address and all that. But uh, as I said many times, we as German government and we as Europeans, we will continue to have to do more for our defense, more than we've done so far. On the one hand, we need to reduce the burden on the United States because they have to be active in other regions as well, but also we want to be an equal partner and, and work together at eye level. 
and that is irrespective of the outcome of the US elections. And uh, Minister, Minister Reynolds, 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 giving you the chance to be the first cabinet minister to call the presidential election outcome. Uh, <laughs> any thoughts on what's happening in the year? Well, look, thanks uh, very much, Peter. And uh, I think like most of the world, I've been glued to my TV for the last couple of days. Uh, and you know what I see is a very robust and healthy democracy in action. And the relationship between the United States and Australia, it is deep, it is enduring, and it will, and our alliance will remain strong and enduring no matter who wins uh, the presidential election. And that was very clear both to myself and Maurice Payne uh, when we visited uh, Washington a few months ago for Osmin. And there was very strong, very strong bipartisan support for additional engagement in our region, uh, but there was really strong uh, support for our alliance. And there was an increasing recognition, uh, even from the last OSMIN, uh, that I, the first one that I attended, in a recognition uh, in the United States, in the administration and in the Congress, about our, our position in the world here in, in the fulcrum of the Indo-Pacific, but also our thoughts, our opinions, and also our defence strategic updates ha have resonated extremely well in Washington. So I might just come back, Peter, to something that I sort of alluded to in my uh, formal remarks, is that the Australian United Alliance has been a major force for stability and also security in our region uh, pretty much you know, since not long after World War II. And Australia made, we made it very clear in our strategic updates that we strongly support the continued US engagement in our region. So we welcome other friends and partners are also having increased uh, engagement in this region. Um, so I, I only see good uh, from whoever wins. Uh, it will make very little difference to the strength uh, and the growth in our defence to defence relationships. Thanks, Minister. I was going to ask uh, the both of you about COVID, but we, we only have about eight minutes left. The, the time has gone so quickly. So I'm, I'll skip that and go to my final questions, which uh, to both of you will be about technology and uh, critical minerals, critical materials, uh, because I know that uh, you, you both have uh, interests in, in these areas. Minister Kramp Karamba, um, the policy guidelines refer to 5G technology as, quote, an essential prerequisite for effective industry 4.0. Zero, uh, which has been a sort of a major part of Germany's future industrial design. The policy guidelines then say the trustworthiness of suppliers of critical components is an important factor for the federal government. This is referring to 5G. This includes the legal and political framework within which the provider operates. Now, to me, uh, Minister, the, the paper reads increasingly like Germany is adopting a policy on 5G, much like Australia. Is that a uh, correct assumption? And what are your views on the prospects for technology cooperation with Australia? When it comes to 5G, I think we agree in principle it is essential for the for future developments and it is very relevant to security so those who are involved in establishing 5G, the companies that are involved, they need to comply with certain security standards. We have a debate about that in Germany and we decided that we don't want to exclude certain companies per se, but that we want to define certain security standards and guarantees and whether someone takes part in a bid and whether they will be selected, that depends on whether they can come up with those necessary assurances. And I think that is something that um, we share with Australia. And we talked about the question of increased future cooperation in the security sector, talked about that earlier, and 
talked about new technologies in part. Germany is um, location or for modern technology, and we see that future production and f the future industrial basis will depend on developing these technologies further. And we also see that these technologies have an increasing role to play for defense. For example, threats um, from the air or the space. We have no longer just the classic combat aircraft or ground-based um, missiles. We see that in the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, drones are important. Hypersonic weapons could be important. So we will see developments of new threats, and that's why we need to align our defense systems to that. It's a big step, a big jump ahead of us, and we want to um, do that in good cooperation with others, also in good cooperation with Australia. Thank you, Minister. And uh, Minister Reynolds, my last question to you, also on the uh, um, uh, technology and, and uh, critical minerals front. I, I know you've been very focused on critical minerals and rare earths and supply chain security uh, in your time. What are your thoughts on the potential for Germany and Australia to cooperate in that area and, and on technology more broadly? Uh, you may need to unmute, uh, Linda. Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, Peter, in short, uh, there are great potential for not only Australia and Germany to work together, but again for other like-minded nations uh, across Europe uh, and also across our region. Uh, Australia is a, has, got, has great reserves of tech metals and rare earths, uh, but unfortunately the way the market has played out uh, in these commodities over time, uh, some of the uh, there is no uh, functioning market for many of these commodities. So we're having uh, talks with very uh, great, talk with the United States, with the EU, with Germany, uh, Japan, Korea and South Korea, Korea and others um, on how we can actually get a, an alternate supply chain so that uh, it, it cannot be used. So if you have one country that has the majority or in some of these commodities all of the supply of refined metals uh, to be used in batteries, in for magnets, etc. Uh, that is a critical vulnerability for many of our economies. So uh, as Minister of Defence, I'm looking at this through a defence lens and it is very important that we do establish alternate supply chains. And as a Senator for Western Australia, where we have a lot of these commodities, uh, I'm also working with the industry on how we can uh, get a a seamless supply chain from pit through to the factory that produces batteries and uh, magnets, etc. So it's a, a work in progress, but it is important and there is no better place for us to start than with Germany, us as a supplier and Germany as a consumer of a lot of these minerals. Minister Reynolds, thank you so very much for that. Both ministers, it's been a great conversation. We, we could easily talk for uh, hours, I think, about so many of the issues that have been raised and the potential for enhanced cooperation between our two countries. But I'm afraid we have to bring the meeting to a close. Uh, and to do that, I'm now going to hand over to Beatrice Goranchi for some final words. Beatrice, over to you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the end of our official proceedings. The speeches of both ministers and the discussion have once more made it obvious how close our two regions are in terms of short, shared values and common interests, especially in tackling the different crises we are facing. To conclude, let me highlight two values in particular, sustainability and resilience, be it politically or economically, or with regard to people-to-people -to -people connectivity. With sustainability and resilience, I mean tenacity in pursuing a common ideal, the aforementioned vision of a thriving liberal democratic order founded on the rule of law. 
We are facing and might continue to face for a long time many obstacles and challenges to achieving this globally, but by persistently and dynamically pursuing this goal together and by also strengthening the multilateral approach, we will get much closer to its realization than on our own. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, let me express our utmost thankfulness to the Honourable Anna Great Crump Kahnbauer and Senator the Honourable Linda Reynolds for their highly inspiring and thought provoking speeches. I would also like to thank both ministers that they further took the time to engage in a discussion. And of course, a big thank you to Mr. Peter Jennings for the once more excellent moderation and his trademark incisive commentary. Thank you also very much to the ASPI and CAST teams for their marvelous cooperation in preparing for the event. And equally, I would like to highlight the great cooperation with the teams from the German and the Australian Defense Ministries. Let me express my personal thanks to Lieutenant Colonel Alois Wagner, the Defence Attaché of the German Embassy for the indefatigable cooperation and the German Embassy team for their invaluable support. The circumstances did not permit to have Minister Kramp Karrenbauer personally with us in Australia and neither to welcome Minister Reynolds physically here at ASPI, but the excellent technical expertise of the ASPI team and the technical experts in Berlin managed us to a point where geographical distance did not matter. Let me also thank all participants very cordially for responding so positively to our invitation and for joining us, be it physically here at the ASPI or virtually from all different places all over the world. We wish everyone a good day in Europe and a good evening in Australia. Stay safe and healthy wherever you are. And once more, a big applause to both of our ministers and goodbye. Mm -hmm.